Good morning, Wareham. Okay. Good morning, uh, Connor. Uh, we're going to learn about Chapter 4, A Most Remarkable Man. Um, we're just going to learn more about the uh, French and Indian War, really. Okay? At the very time of the humiliation at Fort Duquesne, when George Washington, Daniel Boone, and General Edward Braddock were defeated by French and Indian foes, a Mohawk Indian was readying himself for a warrior's dance. The Mohawk, named Waregiage, painted bright designs on his naked chest, stepped into a deerskin kilt adorned with a porcupine quills, and donned a cap topped with a single eagle feather. Tied to his wrists and ankles were dry deer hooves that rattled as he moved. He ate of ceremonial dog meat and threw a red painted hatchet onto a war post. Soon he would lead the strenuous dance. That Waragiage had hazel eyes and spoke Mohawk with a brogue of an Irishman made no difference to those who would follow him into battle. But they were able to judge a man by what he was, not by what he seemed on the surface. And clearly this man was remarkable. And there's his picture right there. The person who was a Mohawk. They adopted him. His name was William Johnson. To begin, he was English and loyal to his king. An enormous bear of a man. Well, Regiage was so full of energy, good spirits, and generosity that even those who thought they would not like him were soon won over. He was both an English and American and an Indian American, and he did his best in each of those worlds. No one on this continent has ever done that as well. But he was plain William Johnson when he arrived in New York in 1738, at age 23, from a farm near Dublin. He had no money, but he did have an important relative, an English arm admiral who sent him up the Hudson River to manage a farm that the admiral had bought from the widow of Governor William Cosby. Do you remember Governor Bill Cosby? Well, soon Johnson soon had land of his own. He became a fur trader and was known to be fair and honest. That was unusual. Many white traders tried to cheat the Indians. Johnson's honesty paid off. Before long, he owned more than 30 trading posts from Detroit to Albany. He has been called America's first chain store owner. He became rich, immensely rich. But that is not all. He won two battles that changed American history. After the first of those battles, he was knighted by the king. He became Sir William Johnson. Sir William Waregiage Johnson had a zest for life. He knew how to have a good time. He lived like a feudal lord in a great big mansion, but he never seems to have taken advantage of anyone. In the mid-18th century, William Johnson became one of the colony's best-known citizens and one of its largest landowners. He was, as I said, remarkable. But as you know, when he first moved into New York Territory near Albany, William Johnson was an unknown young man with a rich uncle and no money of his own. Right away, he did a very sensible thing. He met his neighbors, the Mohawk Indians, and learned their language. Immediately, he liked them, and they liked him. Johnson became a good friend of Tayanoga, the wise and regal sachem who was called Hendrick by the Dutch and the English. Tyanoga Hendrick was one of the four Indian sachems, the British called them kings, who back in 1710 went to England and met Queen Anne. Johnson soon learned the ways of the Mohawk and was named as one of them. Johnson's biographer said, Sir William has a well was a well-adjusted European man. Well, Regia Gay thought and acted as an Indian. These two personalities lived together without strain in one keen mind and passionate heart. It was a time of jealousy between European peoples. Religious wars had made conditions horrible in parts of Germany, so Germans began moving to New York. The Dutch were already there, and so were the English. 
instead of cooperating, they sometimes said nasty things about each other, and about the Indians too. Johnson would have none of that. It was the way men and women behaved that was important to him. Anyone kind and decent became his friend. His red brick manor house always overflowed with people. His wife, Digan Wadamte, was known as Molly Brandt, was as bold and intelligent as he. Molly was said to be handsome and uncommonly agreeable and a political young lady of the royal blood of the Mohawks. She was known for her skills in forest medicine. Her grandfather was one of the four Indian kings who had been to London to meet the queen. They gone on Dante and Waregege were married in, an, in the Indian way, perhaps in 1757. She was 21, he was 42. It was a happy marriage, and they had seven children. But I'm getting, away, I'm getting away from the subject. This chapter is really about the French and Indian War. Remember, the war began badly for the English. The French and their Indian allies were better than the English in fighting in the wilderness. Great Britain knew it needed Indian allies if it was going to win this war. In 1754, which was the same year that George Washington and his scouts killed ten Frenchmen, some English colonists met in Albany with men from the Iroquois nations. Benjamin Franklin came. William Johnson was there, so was Hendrick, who was much admired by the English. The reason for the conference was to get the Iroquois allies. It didn't happen. The Indians wouldn't say yes or no, they just listened. The conference did start the colonial leaders thinking about the Iroquois plan of government. The Iroquois had united six tribes into a confederation. Benjamin Franklin suggested the colonies unite into a colonial nation. He could see that uniting the tribes had made the Iroquois strong. It would be a strange thing, said Franklin. If six nations of ignorant savages should be capable of forming a scheme for such a union and be able to execute it in such a manner as that as has subsisted ages and appears indissoluble, and yet that a like union should be impracticable for ten or a dozen English colonies. In simple English, that means the Indians have a good system for organizing separate states into a government why don't we consider a system like that? Did you notice that Benjamin Franklin threw in those words, ignorant savages? Why would he call them that? Was it because the Indians didn't have written languages and sometimes wore a few clothes? Or do you think Ben had his tongue in his cheek, which means he was using irony, saying one thing when he meant it, its opposite? Ignorant savages were the words most white people of those days used to describe the Native Americans. Ben Franklin was never like most people. Besides, he knew many Indian leaders and respected the ideas. All right, so, in other words, Ben Franklin was being sarcastic. And he's saying, these ignorant savages, meaning what you call ignorant savages, are smarter than you. That's what he was saying. But I'm getting away from the point again. The main reason for the Albany Conference was to find a way to solve the problem of French and Indian power. And that hadn't been done. The delegates to the conference sent a message to the English king. There is the utmost danger that the whole continent will be subjected to the French. England had to get the Iroquois to fight on their side. There was only one man who might make that possible. Da da da, William Johnson. He was named superintendent of Indian affairs of the northern colonies. As Waregege, he called a great meeting. The council fire of the Iroquois League was lit on his property. Whole Indian villages came and camped in his yard. The Iroquois were uneasy. They had no wish to fight a white man's war. They had no wish to fight other Indians. Well, Regige sat at the council fire. He listened carefully and spoke forcefully. He had learned the Indian art of oratory. Then he did it. He persuaded his Indian friends to fight on the side of the British. He promised that their land would be protected, and he thought he would honor that promise. Then, Waregege and his Indian brothers prepared for battle. A French army was on its way to Albany. The French should sail down Lake Champlain, 
and were now at a lake they called St. Sacrament. Johnson renamed it Lake George in honor of the English king. The French army was led by a German major general hired by the French because he had won many battles in Europe. His name was Baron Ludwig Dyskal, and he was wily. His well-trained army was composed of French soldiers, Canadians, and Native Americans. General William Johnson had never seen a battle before. He was on his own with his friend Hendrick, some Indian warriors, and untested soldiers from New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and New York. There were no British soldiers. Hendrick, now an old man, insisted on leading his warriors himself. Some of the New England New Englanders, especially those from, from from puritanical Massachusetts, had heard tales of the way Johnson lived, of the Indians who camped on his lawn, and of the grand parties he threw. They disapproved until they met him. A Massachusetts doctor who fought at Lake George wrote this in a letter home. I must say, he's a complete gentleman and willing to oblige and please all men. Familiar and free of access to the lowest sentinel. A gentleman of uncommon smart sense and even temper. Never yet saw him in a ruffle or even use any bad language. He's almost universally beloved and esteemed by officers and soldiers for coolness of head and warmness of heart. What happened was astounding. A small army of Native Americans and American colonists beat the French all by themselves without the aid of the regular British Army. It was a major victory, not easily won. And London people cheered and cheered, and they wept too, when they heard that old warrior Hendrick had died in the battle, as did young Colonel Ephraim Williams, who made his will before the fight, and left what he owned to start a small college in Massachusetts. I think that's called William College. The story of the Battle of Lake George was told all over Europe and America. People heard how Johnson was shot in the hip and how he had saved the wounded German baron from some Indians who wished to scalp him. In Portugal, a song was sung of Wilhelm Gonson and his triumph. The painted warrior named Waregi Agay became a romantic hero and the English king made him a baronet. That means he was now a knight. And a sir. All right, that was a long chapter about a weird guy, or a cool guy with a weird name, or Reggie again. Uh, it's interesting. Some people thought that if he didn't die, he might have been the general of uh, the American army and not Washington. He was so popular back then. But he, he had passed. He was really old. All right. Well, we'll see you later. Say good night, Connor. Good night. Ducks for him, uh, sorry, we're him in the school. All right, buddy. From Duxbury. Good night, we're him.